The subject of our discussion today is admittedly one of the less pleasant passages in the Torah. One might even say, much as it's a difficult thing to say, that it almost reads as a disgusting story. I wonder how you describe a story like this to children. In Genesis chapter 19, we read of the final episode recorded in the Bible of the life of Lot. And, truth be told, the incestuous relationship that he had with his daughters. We're not going to read everything inside, mostly because we have a lot to see today, and our time is limited. But certainly the salient aspects of the story, it's important for us to recall, this is following the destruction of Sodom and the other cities of the plain. And Lot is in a cave together with his two daughters. And what emerges from what they say is their conviction that it wasn't just that Sodom was destroyed, but rather the whole world was destroyed. And no one is left except the three of them, Lot and his two daughters. So in chapter 19, verse 31, the firstborn said to the younger, our father is old and there is not a man in the earth to come in unto us after the manner of all the earth. So what's going to be with humanity? The only available solution, come or go, let us make our father drink wine and we will lie with him that we may preserve seed of our father. And that's what they did. First night, the firstborn came in and lay with her father. The following night, the younger sister does, each time essentially drugging Lot with wine so he wasn't conscious of what they were doing. And as summarized in verse 36, thus were both the daughters of Lot with child by their father. Verse 37, and the firstborn bore a son and called his name Moab. Now Moab, as I noted, literally means from father. The same letters and the same root as over here, Me'avihen, from their father. Well, Moab, from father. A rather explicit, unambiguous way of describing the paternity of the child. And in verse 38, the younger also bore a son and called his name Ben-Ami, a somewhat gentler euphemism. Ben-Ami, son of my people, or son of my kin, the same as the father of the children of Ammon unto this day. So here we have a description of not only Lot and his daughters, but the origins of two nations that figure prominently, not, mind you, especially positively, in the history of Israel, Moab and Ammon. As historical nations, perhaps the first encounter of the nation of Israel with them is described in retrospect in Deuteronomy chapter 2. We'll consider this passage and a number of additional passages that describe our interfacing with these nations, but before we embark upon this discussion, I feel compelled to remind you of something pretty foundational that we've discussed in the past. Namely, the Bible is not a history book. First of all, much, most of history isn't recorded. Second of all, even what is recorded is not recorded to give us history lessons. You have your history books for that. The Bible is teaching us how to live. And especially when we consider so sordid a tale as the daughters of Lot bearing 
their father's, shall we say, children or grandchildren through incest. There has to be something important for us to learn from this. Not, mind you, to learn from this regarding some forgotten nations that have become obscured in the sands of time already for millennia, but rather something to learn from this for ourselves, for our own lives, for our challenges and responsibilities in this world. So, with that crucial caveat to be borne in mind, we embark on our historical overview. Again, Deuteronomy chapter 2. In Deuteronomy chapter 2, we read of the sojourns of the nation of Israel journeying through the wilderness. And in verse 8, So we passed by from our brethren, the children of Esau, that dwell in Seir, from the way of the Arava, from Elat, and from Etzion Geber, and we turned and passed by the way of the wilderness of Moab. The first of these nations. And God said to me, Be not at enmity with Moab, neither contend with them in battle, for I will not give you of his land for a possession, for I have given Ar unto the children of Lot for a possession. And likewise, regarding the other of these nations, a few verses later, in verse 70, we read that God spoke to me, saying that you are this day to pass over the border of Moab, even Ar, and when you come near over against the children of Ammon, harass them not, nor contend with them, for I will not give you of the land of the children of Ammon for a possession, because I have given it unto the children of Lot for a possession. So Moab and Ammon are off limits. And even after we read subsequently of the battles of Israel, against Sichon and Og, Moses stresses, verse 36, from Aroer, which is on the edge of the valley of Arnon, and from the city that is in the valley, even unto Gilad, there was not a city too high for us. God our Lord delivered up all before us, that is, all of the nations governed by Sichon and Og, respectively, the Emirates. However, only to the land of the children of Ammon you came not near. All the side of the river Yabok and the cities of the hill country, and wheresoever God our Lord forbade us. We did not invade the territories of Moab or Ammon. They were explicitly placed off limits to us by God. So, our first historic encounter with these nations was benevolent, benevolent, that is, at least on our side, but only on our side, because certainly reads very steeply downhill from there. When Israel came to the plains of Moab, of course, the Jordan from Jericho. This we read, not in the retrospective of Moses' description of what had happened in Deuteronomy. We read it in Numbers chapter 22. The children of Israel journeyed and pitched in the plains of Moab. And Balak, the son of Tzipor, saw all that Israel had done to the Amorites, and Moab, Balak's nation has become clear shortly, was sore afraid of the people because they were many. And Moab was overcome with dread because of the children of Israel. And Moab said to the elders of Midian, now this multitude will lick up all that is round about us as the ox licks up the grass of the field. And Balak, the son of Tzipor, was king of Moab at that time. And they sent a dispatch to Bil'am the son of Beor, the soothsayer. 
describing the situation and soliciting his help specifically. Go now, therefore, I pray you, curse me, this people, so they are too mighty for me. For adventure I shall prevail that we may smite them and that I may drive them out of the land. For I know that he whom you bless is blessed, and he whom you curse is cursed. Curse Israel. Of course, thanks to God's intervention, Ilam does not curse Israel, but rather blesses them. And this was the intention of Moab in this opening encounter with Israel. Curse them so I can smite them. While the first scene, the attempt at cursing the nation fails, the second, the attempt at corrupting them, tragically succeeds. In Numbers chapter 25 we read, and Israel abode in Shittim, and the people began to commit harlotry with the daughters of Moab. And they called the people unto the sacrifices of their gods, and the people did eat and bowed down to their gods. And Israel joined himself unto the Baal of Peor, and the anger of God was kindled against Israel. And what ensues is a devastating plague of punishment and destruction. And those that died by the plague were 24,000. So there's an attempt to curse, it failed. The attempt to corrupt, it succeeded. And by consequence, in Deuteronomy chapter 23, we read of an eternal ban on these two nations. In verse 4, an Ammonite or a Moabite shall not enter into the assembly of God, even to the tenth generation, shall none of them enter into the assembly of God forever. The reason, verse 5, because they met you not with bread and with water in the way when you came forth out of Egypt, and because they hired against you, Bil'am, son of Be'or, from the door of Aram Naraim, to curse you. Now, it didn't happen. Nevertheless, God your Lord would not hearken to Bil'am, but God, your Lord, turned the course into a blessing for you because God, your Lord, loved you. But that's what they were intent upon doing. And you shall not seek their peace nor their prosperity all your days forever. Which means, as a matter of practicality in principle, that neither an Ammonite nor a Moabite is ever eligible to convert and become a full-fledged member of the nation of Israel. That is, even one who would convert and become part of the nation of Israel would be forever ineligible to convert and his offspring for all generations to marry into the nation of Israel. Now, I should note that while this is, of course, on the books, in the book, in the Torah, in our tradition it is no longer practicable, for the simple reason that after Sennacherib, Sennacherib, emperor of Assyria, swept through this part of the world with the exiling policy of the Assyrian Empire, which, of course, resulted in the ten tribes of northern Israel being dispersed beyond recognition, one can no longer identify any nation as derived genealogically from its forebear. So whoever is dwelling in the territory of Ammon and the territory of Moab today is not considered to be an Ammonite or a Moabite, with respect to this law in the Torah. So, of course, in practice, we should note that this law remains impracticable. But that doesn't mean it's not there to teach us something. For what these nations did, they are forever proscribed. 
from becoming part of the nation of Israel. It's instructive, as a matter of comparison, to note in the next verse, you shall not abhor an Edomite, for he is your brother, and perhaps more startling, you shall not abhor an Egyptian, because you were a stranger in his land. The children of the third generation that are born unto them may enter into the assembly of God. All other nations have no restriction whatsoever. And again, I reiterate, nowadays, no nation has any restriction on being able to convert and join up with the nation of Israel. But consider the comparison between the Egyptian and the Ammonite and Moabite. The Egyptians threw our children in the Nile. The Egyptians did their utmost to annihilate us. What altogether did Moab do? In practice, beyond the attempt at a curse, they failed anyway. They corrupted us with their idolatry. And for this, they are forever banned. From this, in our tradition, we learn a lesson, I submit to you, a, a crucially important lesson for our lives, irrespective of whether we could ever run into anyone from Ammon or Moab. And that is, if a person corrupts his fellow, that's considered worse than killing him. The Egyptians were trying to kill us. They're not entirely banned. When one kills another person, that is indeed a grievous sin, a terrible crime, one that in the Torah carries the death penalty. But even murder is, after all, only in one world, in this world. Not to minimize the gravity of the crime, but if a person corrupts another human being, it's tantamount to killing him, not just in that narrow window of sojourn in this world. How long would we live anyway? 70 years, 120 years, even hundreds of years. Everlasting life is forever. Corruption drives a person out of eternity. That is a far more, an incomparably worse crime than merely murder. Merely. Not, not in any way, of course, to minimize murder. So, of course, to that extent, we get something of a sense of our relationship with Moab and Ammon beyond God's prohibiting Israel from going into battle with them as a relationship that got off to a bumpy start, to say the least. And it's still, sad to say, goes from bad to worse. In Judges chapter 3, we read of one of the first instigations against the nation of Israel here in its land, in the land of Israel. Of course, a recurrent theme throughout the book of Judges is Israel sins and God punishes. And in chapter 3, verse 12, the children of Israel again did that which was evil in the sight of God, and God strengthened Eglon, the king of Moab, against Israel, because they had done that which was evil in the sight of God. And he gathered unto the children of Ammon and Amalek, and he went and fought Israel. So here you have both Moab and Ammon. We find them repeatedly in Scripture, operating as partners, coming and smiting Israel. And the children of Israel served Eglon, king of Moab, 
18 years. But when the children of Israel cried unto God, God raised them up a savior, Ehud, the son of Gerah, the Benjaminite. And what follows is a description of the intrigue through which Ehud contrives to murder Eglon, king of Moab. That's what we read in the continuation of the chapter. We won't be discussing the details right now. And in the wake of the murder, the battle is fought, Moab is vanquished, and the end of the story in verse 30, so Moab was subdued that day under the hand of Israel, and the land had rest 80 years. But of course, it still is only temporary. In Judges chapter 10, once again, we read of the sins of Israel. The children of Israel again did that which was evil in the sight of God and served the various pagan deities of the idolatrous nations that lived round about them. And not insignificantly, on the list we find the gods of Moab and the gods of the children of Ammon. And in chapter 10, verse 7, the anger of God was kindled against Israel, and he gave them over into the hands of the Philistines and into the hand of the children of Ammon. And they pressed and crushed the children of Israel that year, 18 years, oppressed they, all the children of Israel that were beyond the Jordan in the land of the Amorites, which is in Gilad. And the children of Ammon passed over the Jordan to fight also against Judah and against Benjamin and against the house of Ephraim, so that Israel was sore distressed. That is, geographically, Ammon is located on the east side of the Jordan River, so the oppression was first directed against the tribes of Israel that lived in the eastern part of the land of Israel, east of the Jordan River. As undoubtedly you recall, the tribes of Reuben, Gad, and half of Menasheh lived there. And now they're also crossing over the Jordan and doing battle with Judah, Benjamin, and Ephraim on the west side of the Jordan, in western land of Israel. And the children of Israel cried unto God, saying, We have sinned against you, and that we have forsaken our God, and have served the Baalim, the idols. And ultimately, they right their wrongs. In verse 15, And the children of Israel said unto God, We have sinned. Do unto us whatever seems good to you, only deliver us, we pray, this day from Ammon. And they put away the strange gods from among them and served God. And as it were, God's soul was grieved for the misery of Israel. And the children of Ammon gathered together at the end of chapter 10, as do the children of Israel, Gilad, facing mitzvah, and in chapter 11, we read of the battle that ensues. God establishes as judge Jephthah Yiftach of Gilad, and when it came to pass after a while that the children of Ammon made war against Israel, he is the one who was chosen as captain, he sends dispatches to Ammon to dissuade them from battle, to indeed reject the claims of Ammon, that they have legitimate territorial claims against Israel. And Yiftach's final words to Ammon, I therefore have not sinned against you, but you do me wrong to war against me. God, the judge, be judge this day between the children of Israel and the children of Ammon. And the king of the children of Ammon 
ignores these words, whereupon we read in verse 29, the Spirit of God came upon Jephthah, upon Iftach, and he passed over Gilad and Nashe, and passed over the Mitzvah of Gilad, and from there passed over unto the children of Ammon to fight him. And God delivered them into his hand, and he smote them. He smote them from Aroer until you come to meet even 20 cities. And the children of Ammon were subdued before the children of Israel. And you note, both Moab and Ammon coming together, coming singly, these are, if you will, whips in God's hand chastising Israel for having done what was wrong in God's sight. And the battles continue, certainly doesn't end there. We'll note one additional one because it figures prominently in the history of Israel. In Samuel 1, chapter 11, Nachash the Ammonite, again Ammon, came up and camped against Yadesh Gilad, again in eastern Israel on the east side of the Jordan River and he presents the people there with a rather dire ultimatum that in order to secure peace from him he demands gouging out the right eyes of all the men and laying it as a reproach upon all of Israel and the elders of Yavesh send messengers to the rest of Israel in the western part of the land of Israel to solicit their help and King Saul newly anointed but not really operating as king yet hears of what is taking place and we read in verse Six, the Spirit of God came mightily upon Saul when he heard these words, and what follows is the great battle that King Saul leads against the Ammonites and completely smote the Ammonites, such that, as we read in verse 11, they that remained were scattered so that two of them were not left together, Whereupon, the people are truly ready to embrace King Saul as their king. And Samuel says to the people, go on, let us go to Gilgal and renew the kingdom there. So the beginning of the monarchy of Israel is enmeshed with yet another battle of Ammon against Israel. It still keeps on going on. These nations were relentlessly our adversaries. To cite just one final example from considerably later, in the time of Jehoshaphat, righteous king of Judah, he came to pass after this, the children of Moab and the children of Ammon and with them some of the Ammonites came against Jehoshaphat the battle. Once again, these nations come together, come together against Israel. Then there came some that told Yoshavat, saying, there comes a great multitude against you from beyond the sea, from Aram. And Yoshavat feared and set himself to seek unto God and proclaim the fast throughout all of Judah. And all of Judah gathers themselves together to seek God. And they assemble in the Holy Temple in the house of God, and Yahshaphat speaks to God in prayer. Verse 6 of Chronicles 2, chapter 20, and he said, O Lord, the God of our fathers, are not you alone God in heaven, and are not you ruler over all the kingdoms of the nations? And in your hand is power and might, so that none is able to withstand you. And continuing in verse 10, Now behold the children of Ammon and Moab and Mount Seir, whom you would not let Israel invade when they came out of the land of Egypt. 
Remember? Deuteronomy chapter 2. But they turned aside from them and destroyed them not. So look at how they're paying us back. Behold, they render unto us evil to come to test us out of your possession, which you have given us to inherit. We didn't do anything to repossess them, to cast them out of their possession. And here, that's exactly what they're trying to do to us. Oh, our God, will you not execute judgment on them? For we have no might against this great multitude that comes against us. Neither know we what to do, but our eyes are upon you. And what follows is the declaration of one of the people upon whom God's Spirit comes in prophecy, that they have nothing to fear, and indeed, even without going to battle against the multitude, the multitude is destroyed by God. Once again, it's Abon and Moab coming at the adversaries of Israel. Until, of course, eventually, they were no longer coming as adversaries because they ceased to exist, at least. They ceased to exist as well-defined genealogical ethnic entities. Still there someplace, probably. Many of the people around us are still descended to this day from Amon and Moab, but uh, their identities, of course, have become obscured. But I want to stress this specific dimension that Yehoshaphat emphasizes in his prayer. It's not merely an adversarial attitude. They're coming to do war against us. There is a fundamental injustice here. They are repaying the good that we gave them with evil. We didn't do anything against them. We didn't do anything against them as stressed in Deuteronomy chapter 2. We didn't do anything against them despite the attempt to curse us and then to corrupt us, of which we read in Numbers in chapters 22 and 25, respectively. And here they are, repeatedly, coming to do battle against us, coming to destroy us. And you know, on some plane, one can't help but associate this attitude, this relentless dedication to do evil with the location that serves as their origin in the world. Of course, I'm referring back to Genesis chapter 19, back to Sodom and Gomorrah and the other wicked cities of the plain that were destroyed. And it's as if there's this vestigial holdout of the evil that was exemplified by Sodom that continues to persist for generations afterward in Ammon and Moab. Now, we're not going to discuss the wickedness of Sodom and Gomorrah now. We did that last year. We've done that in other contexts. But it is indeed undoubtedly germane to recall that there is this legacy of wickedness in the world. I'm not making this into a genealogical argument because it really isn't. It's more the ideological realization that there are forces of evil. There are forces of destruction that are about in the world. And indeed, it is noteworthy that, well, of course, we read in Genesis of the legendary wickedness of Sodom. The men of Sodom were wicked and sinners against God exceedingly in Genesis chapter 13, verse 13. In Genesis chapter 18, verse 20, the cry of Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and verily their sin is exceeding grievous. Yet, they become paradigms of evil in the chastisement of Israel as well. When Isaiah in chapter 3, verse 9 says, the show of their countenance does witness against them, and they declare their sin as Sodom, they hide it not. He's not talking about the Sodomites. He's talking about Israel. 
likewise. In Jeremiah chapter 23, verse 14, but the prophets of Jerusalem have seen a horrible thing. They commit adultery, they walk in lies, and they strengthen the hands of evildoers, that none does return from his wickedness. They are all of them become unto me as Sodom, as the inhabitants thereof, as, and the inhabitants thereof as Gemara. Again, this is a rebuke of Israel. Because there's this archetypal wickedness, this archetypal evil that is exemplified by Sodom and unfortunately continues to be actualized among its latter day heirs, whether they be heirs genealogically, geographically, or simply ideologically. This is an ongoing challenge. And indeed, Ezekiel, in his words of rebuke of Israel, recalls this source of wickedness. In chapter 16, verse 49, Behold, this was the iniquity of your sister Sodom, pride, fullness of bread, and careless ease was in her and in her daughters, neither did she strengthen the hand of the poor and needy. So having come then to this bird's eye view, if you will, of history, the legacy ideologically of Sodom and its actualization in the unconscionable behavior of Ammon and Moab, I share with you something that at this stage might seem exceedingly strange, even dismaying. In Psalm 89, we read of the extolling of God's kindnesses. I will sing of the mercies of God forever. They have said, forever is mercy built in the very heavens to establish your faithfulness. And it is on that basis that the psalmist speaks of God's covenant with David. I have sworn unto David, my servant, it is an eternal covenant. Forever will I establish your seed and build up your throne to all generations. And what follows is further extolling that source of righteousness and justice, God's throne, as it were, and the terrestrial throne that God establishes for David. And we get to verse 21. Now, verse 21 seems fairly innocuous, except that the expression is odd. I have found David my servant. With my holy oil have I anointed him. I have found David, my servant. I misplaced him. He was hidden. He was lost. I have found. What does found mean? Especially when we're referring to God. And here I share with you an ancient tradition. An ancient tradition that at this juncture, especially after speaking at such great length about Moab, is veritably begging to be mentioned. We have an ancient tradition on this verse. I have found David, my servant, where? In Sodom. In Sodom. Well, of course, found implies may be misplaced. Not, of course, literally misplaced, but still, of all places, David, not just David. We know who descends from King David, the King Messiah. David and his offspring, including the Messiah, have their roots 
in the song. How so? Of course, the answer I think is clear to us all. We're referring, of course, to King David's great grandmother. King David's great grandmother was Ruth. Ruth, the Moabite, who comes from the nation of Moab. Now, I realize undoubtedly the first question that you're all wondering about is how could Ruth altogether become part of the nation of Israel if she comes from the tribe of Moab? If Moab was banned, then how did she enter the nation altogether? Our answer is going back to the circumstances that God expresses with respect to the prohibition of allowing Moab and Damon into the nation of Israel, greeting us with food and drink. This is something that was regarded, certainly in bygone times, as the sort of activity that you would expect, indeed, almost demand, of the men, but not the women, to go and bring food and drink to strange nations that are camping on their border. That would be unseemly and disrespectful to the women folk. So the ban was placed upon the men and not the women. Males of Amon and Boav are banned. Females are not. That, at the very least, to respond to the technical question, but on a much more substantive plane. We consider what Ammon and Moab exemplified. What Sodom exemplified. In both cases, I have everything that I need, and I don't care about you. Again, recall the words of Ezekiel, not upholding the poor and the needy. Look out for number one, the Americans say. And when they say number one, they're not talking about God. That look out for number one, I am all that matters, is the self-centered egotistical arrogance that exemplified Sodom and exemplified Ammon and Moab. And it is precisely from that rootstock that Ruth emerges. And while the limits of time preclude our studying the book of Ruth now more thoroughly, I certainly hope we'll have other opportunities to do so. What is so glaring, what is so highlighted throughout the book of Ruth is the message of kindness. It's kindness on the part of first Ruth to Naomi. That is when Ruth's sister-in-law kisses her mother-in-law and goes back unto her people and unto her God, as Naomi expresses it. Ruth says, entreat me not to leave you and to return from following after you. For where you go, I go. Where you lodge, I lodge. Your people are my people and your God, my God. Where you die, I die. And there will I be buried. I swear. So may God do to me and more also, if anything but death parts between you and me. Ruth's message of kindness. And of course it continues in chapter two, Ruth, who by our tradition was a royal princess, goes out in the most demeaning fashion to try to scrounge up food to sustain herself and Naomi. And then, of course, the next bestower of kindness, Boaz, coming on the scene 
and attending to Ruth's needs, telling her not to go gleaning in any other fields, but rather to abide in his fields. And beyond the extraordinary generosity of Boaz in chapter 3, it's Naomi's turn in bestowing kindness. The only thing keeping her alive is her daughter-in-law, but her only concern is, as she expressed it at the beginning of chapter 3, shall I not seek rest for you, that it may be well with you? And what emerges is this complex web of interactions. Ruth to Naomi, Boaz to Ruth, Naomi to Ruth, Ruth to Boaz, Everyone acting out of genuine, selfless concern for the other's well-being. And unbeknownst to them, their actions turn out to be precisely what provides them with the wherewithal to survive. Their lives are saved by their kindness. And of course, inevitably, one can't help but note the bestower of kindness in the wings. From the beginning, when Ruth is looking for a place to glean and she is directed, she knows not how, to the field belonging to Boaz. And so on and so forth. Boaz, speaking of God recompensing Ruth and expressing his blessing, a blessing that ultimately becomes articulated not only by Boaz, but by by the people, the townsfolk of Bethlehem in providing the blessing that indeed Ruth will bear Boaz's child and the final kindness, the kindness that is bestowed by God that indeed Ruth bears a son and the women said to Naomi, Blessed be God, who has not left you this day without a near kinsman, and let his name be famous in Israel. And he shall be unto you a restorer of life and a nourisher of your old age, for your daughter-in-law who loves you, who is better to you than seven sons were born him. And Naomi took the child and laid it in her bosom and became nurse unto it. Such a story of kindness in which every one of the protagonists exemplifies that concern for the other and ultimately becomes the beneficiary of kindness that is most definitively issued, authored by God. I have to tell you that we have an ancient saying regarding the Book of Ruth that you can undoubtedly appreciate in light of the principal focus of traditional Torah scholarship, this book of Ruth doesn't have in it any rules of what is permissible, what is prohibited, what is pure, what is defiled. So why was it written? Answer, it was written to teach us the good reward that God bestows on people who do acts of kindness. And of course, it would be a wonderful story, even if it just ended in verse 16, with that story of kindness coming full circle, but it doesn't end in verse 16. It's critical for us to realize 
the continuation. And that brings us back, of course, to Psalm 89. And the women and her neighbors gave the child a name, saying, There is a son born to Naomi, and they called his name Oved. He is the father of Jesse, the father of David. David's birth is a result of kindness. Kindness by people just doing the right thing. Not for any reason other than because they knew it was right. Not because of any selfish motive. They didn't realize that they were saving their own lives by doing what was right. They just did it. And of course, I'm going to stress again, it's not just about David. It's about the final redemption. And this, I must stress, is critical. Because while the final redemption of the world is, of course, in God's hands, as we've noted on many occasions, God redeems the world through our doing, His work as He has charged us. The Messiah would never be born were it not for acts of kindness. And that brings us back again, inevitably. So, I have found David. I found David in, of all places, Sodom. Clearly misplaced, because in Sodom they didn't do any acts of kindness. But that's precisely the point. Everyone has the opportunity. It's not something exclusively for Israel. It's not something exclusively for anybody. It's in our hands, and it's all up to us. It's significant to note that beyond, of course, the choices that Ruth makes herself, in our tradition, she is descended from a royal lineage, a royal lineage that includes two of the kings of Moab, whom we've mentioned already this evening. In Numbers chapter 22, we read about Balak. In Numbers 23, we read about how hard Balak dedicates himself, so it would seem, to the goal of securing a curse for Israel. That when at the beginning of the chapter, Bilam says to Balak, build seven altars. Balak did as Bilam had spoken, and Balak and Bilam offered on every altar a bullock and a ram. And that doesn't work, so Balak takes him to a different place, and Bilam says again, build seven altars. And they did so, and offered up a bullock and a ram on every altar. And it didn't work there either. So they went to a third place. And Bilam says to Balak to build him seven altars, and again, Balak did as Bilam said, and offered up a bullock and a ram on every altar. It's a lot of altars, a lot of offerings, a lot of hard work. Of course, you will undoubtedly say, but it was work just in order to curse Israel. Of what value is that in our tradition? What Balak did exemplifies doing a good thing for less than perfect reasons. I'm going to stress less than perfect and not say bad reasons because so far as Balak was concerned, he did, after all, have a reason that he felt he needed to secure a curse for Israel. He was afraid of them. They were a threat. So he's concerned for saving his nation. Can you blame a king for being concerned for saving his nation? So out of his concern for saving his nation, he builds all these altars and brings all these offerings and in our tradition by doing so. Balak earned the merit of having a great, 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 great granddaughter who becomes the great grandmother of King David and the progenitor of the Messiah. And considering probably an even more unsavory character 
Remember Eglon in Judges chapter 3? Well, at this point, it's important for us to recall the intrigue through which Ehud contrived to murder Eglon. Then after everyone else is sent away, Ehud came unto him, and he was sitting by himself alone in his cool upper chamber, and Ehud said, I have a message from God unto you. And he arose out of his seat. Now you may recall, he was very fat. Arising out of his seat was probably not such a simple thing to do. But he hears the word of God. And out of respect, Eglon stood up. Ironically, that standing up was the last thing he did because that was precisely the opportunity Ehud needed to kill him. And on the one hand, Eglon is the enemy. Ehud had to kill him in order to save Israel. But on a deeper plane, on another level of meaning, in our tradition, Eglon standing up was what earned him the merit of having a descendant who would become the great grandmother of King David and the ancestor of the Messiah. It's all a matter of choices. And it's not just choices by Israel, it's choices by everyone. Everyone chooses, everyone decides. Am I with God or against God? God gives us the charge. He gives, gives us the opportunity to ally himself with us by our allying ourselves with him. But it's up to us. And you know, considering in this vein the actions of Balak and of Eglon, let's go back to the cave. You know, the story in Genesis chapter 19, as we've noted, is really pretty unseemly, even disgusting. But Lot's daughters had good intentions. Our father was old, and there is not a man in the earth to come in unto us after the manner of all the earth. And the agenda is not because they're interested in conducting incest, but rather that we may preserve the seed of our father. In each case. So, so while the act itself we may indeed regard as reprehensible, the intention was godly. They wanted to save the world. And indeed, in our tradition, we have an ancient tradition that therefore they earned being rewarded because their intention was good. Because in that game of life, in choosing, based upon the knowledge that they had, based upon what they understood, they chose well. No one can fault them for not having knowledge that they didn't have. But given what you know, given the opportunities that you have, how do you choose? That's the challenge. And that remains a challenge perpetually. So, it is in this vein, then, that we consider the lineage of Moab contributing to the Messiah through King David. We'll note also that Ammon likewise contributes to the lineage of the Messiah because Rehavam, the son of King Solomon, is explicitly described as having a mother who was an Ammonite. Doesn't matter. As long as you make the right choices, you're contributing to the fulfillment of God's plan. Which then leads us to consider in broader outline, very briefly, the fate of these nations. Because, on the one hand, while Moab and Ammon both contribute to the final salvation and redemption of the world. What certainly seems to emerge from the prophets is their place themselves 
is destruction. In Isaiah chapter 25, speaking of that blessed day when it will be said, Lo, this is our God for whom we waited, that he might save us. This is the Lord for whom we waited. We will be glad and rejoice in his salvation. Well, on that day, in this mountain will the hand of God rest, and Moab shall be trodden down in his place, even as straw is trodden down on the dunghill, crushing Moab. And his pride will be brought down together with the cunning of his hand. And the high fortress of the walls of Moab, God will bring down, lay low, and bring the ground even to the dust. Destruction. And indeed, likewise, the prophet Sifania, I have heard the taunt of Moab, the reviling of the children of Ammon, wherewith they have taunted my people. Therefore, as I live, says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, surely Moab will be as Sodom and the children of Ammon as Gomorrah, even the breeding place of nettle and salt pits and a desolation forever. <laughs> that is, it's all about choices. We know what kind of choices Sodom and Gomorrah made. Well, if Moab and Ammon make those same choices, they can indeed expect the self-same fate. And likewise, in Ezekiel chapter 25, Son of Man, set your face toward the children of Ammon and prophesy against them. And indeed, speaking of choices, say unto the children of Ammon, hear the word of God, thus says the Lord God, because you said, aha, against my sanctuary when it was profane, and against the land of Israel when it was made desolate, and against the house of Judah when they went into captivity. Verse 4, therefore, behold, I will deliver you to the children of the east for a possession, and they shall set their encampment in you, and make their dwellings in you, and they shall eat your fruit and drink your milk. Desolation, destruction. And likewise, verse 8, we just read about Ammon, now comes Moab's turn, because that Moab and Seir do say, Behold, the house of Judah is like unto all the nations. Therefore, behold, I will open the flank of Moab on the side of the cities, on the side of the cities which are on his frontiers, and together with the children of Ammon, both Ammon and Moab, I give them over as a possession, that the children of Ammon may not be remembered among the nations, and I will execute judgments upon Moab, and they will know that I am God. Again, choices. Choices and their consequences. But, you know, there's a certain nuance that we should consider that was expressed here in Isaiah chapter 25, verse 10. In this mountain will the hand of God rest, and Moab will be trodden down in his place, even as straw is trodden down in the dunghill. You trod straw in the dunghill in order to use it for a constructive purpose, not simply to destroy it. And maybe that's a theme here as well. God has plans for Moab and Ammon. That's why Moab has a daughter named Ruth, and Ammon, a daughter named Naama. And both of them are ancestors of the Messiah. And perhaps, too, that's why when we read with greater elaboration of the final punishment to be visited on Moab and Ammon toward the end of Jeremiah, Jeremiah chapter 48 and Jeremiah chapter 49, there is a detailed lament of the destruction of Moab here in chapter 48. And it culminates with on all the housetops of Moab and in the broad places thereof, there's lamentation everywhere. For I have broken Moab like a vessel wherein is no pleasure, says God. Woe unto you, O Moab, the people of Kemosh is undone, for your sons are taken away captive and your daughters into captivity. 
You get last verse of the chapter. Will I turn the captivity of Moab in the end of days and restore him? Says God. Thus far is the judgment of Moab. It's not over. And in Jeremiah chapter 49, kind of the same thing with respect to Ammon. Of the children of Ammon, thus says God, has Israel no sons? Has he no heir? Why then does Malcolm take possession of God and his people dwell in the cities thereof? The indictment of Ammon. Therefore, behold, the day is come, says God, that I will cause an alarm of war to be heard against Rabbah of the children of Ammon. And it shall become a desolate mound, and her doors shall be burned with fire. And culminating in verse 5, Behold, I will bring a terror upon you, says the Lord God of hosts, from all that are round about you. And you shall be driven out every man right forth, and there shall be none to gather up him that wanders. But here also, just as Jeremiah chapter 48 ended with respect to Moab, but afterward, I will bring back the captivity of the children of the monks as well. So, getting back to that cave near Sodom, the cave that produced these two nations, that historically produced for us heartache, torment, misery, and King David. And, ultimately, the Messiah and the salvation of the world really is all about choices. Sodom and Gomorrah made their choices. Ammon and Moab made their choices. But, you know, Lot's daughters made their choices with the best of intentions. And daughters down the road, Ruth, the Moabite, Nama, the Ammonite, they made their choices too. It's all about choices and bringing them aside. And it's on that note that we conclude that is. Returning to Psalm 89, this is the kindness of God, the divine mercy that serves as the ultimate guarantee of the future. In verse 34, but my birth mercy will I not break off from him, from King David and his offspring, nor will I be false to my faithfulness. My covenant will I not profane, nor alter that which has gone out of my lips. Once I have sworn by my holiness, surely I will not be false unto David. His seed shall endure forever, and his throne as the sun before me. It shall be established forever as the moon, and be steadfast as the witness in the sky. Interesting, isn't it? And on this note, we conclude. Established forever as the moon. The moon? The moon doesn't strike us from our terrestrial vantage point as established forever. On the contrary, it's always moving, always changing, always waxing and waning, increasing, diminishing. Maybe that's precisely the point. When it's all about choices, we encounter that too in this world, in the story of Lot's daughters, in the story of Moab and Ammon, in the story of Ruth and Naamah and King David and the Messiah. It's all about God giving us opportunities. And of course, when God gives the opportunity, the responsibility. That final salvation, that greatest gift, God is waiting to bestow when we're ready to do our share 
as he shows us the way. As he shows us the way, and as in their own way, Lot's daughters showed us the way, and Ruth showed us the way, and Boaz, and Naame, and Naama the Ammonite. It's not specifically about Israel versus the nations, it's from all the nations hearing that call, responding to that charge, and doing God's work as he charges us to bring about that blessed final conclusion. God bless you.